I'd like to remind everybody about our um, gym night on Friday night that started this past week. We had a lot of fun. If you need to, if you got a New Year's resolution to lose weight and get in shape, it's a good way to start. So you can have, come have some fellowship and get a little workout. And, and if, you, if, you're, if you don't want to work out, don't worry. There's another group of people that play cards and board games and stuff like that. So it's not just not all about act, real active activity. It's also just about the fellowship and some things like that. Snacks, too. So uh, we'd love to have you come. Friday night starts about 630. Um, new Sunday school class with uh, Pastor Tim in, in the mornings. If you want to go with that, it's been going on for a couple of weeks now, and uh, it's kind of about the, uh, the foundations of our faith, and uh, the tithing statements are ready. It can be picked up at the office if you want your tithing statement. Um, January calendars, also a calendar of events, are also on the tables in the lobby. Go ahead and get one of those if you would, and that way you can kind of keep up with going, what's going on and won't miss anything. And uh, we'd like to welcome our visitors. There's this tear-off in the bulletin. If you would be so kind as to tear that off, fill it out, and you can drop it off in one of the offering boxes or the welcome center out front. And uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit so we can welcome you. And um, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, we're starting. Our Sunday school classes are going to be changing here pretty soon. Uh, I would like to encourage you to uh, think about attending if you don't already attend. And especially, um, I think uh, the way it's going to be done is we're going to be doing some Answers in Genesis curriculum. Uh, and, uh, and the good thing about that, that curriculum is, you know, it's, of course, it's biblically based. And it goes through the Bible from start to finish, which is kind of nice. And uh, also, it comes in all age brackets. So the, from the little kids to the adults uh, can go through this curriculum. Of course, it's geared towards the age groups. But uh, what's really, I think, pretty neat about it is, if, especially if you're a family, then that can kind of give you some, uh, some, something to talk about on the way home. You can really have a good spiritual conversation with your kids or even the other young people uh, in, in, that may travel with you. Uh, you can go home and say, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And guess what? You'll just gone through the same lesson if you're in Sunday school, and you can really have a good conversation or get a good conversation started that way, spiritual conversations with your young people in your life and, uh, or your parents. Or, I mean, you can reverse that role, too. So I would encourage you to come. It's going to start here uh, at the beginning of next month, probably, in February. So I would encourage you to do that to AIG. The first month is kind of a lot about the Word of God. So if you want to know, learn about the Word of God and have a good foundation about the Word of God, if, you, if you have anybody's ever asked you about the Word of God or you had to defend the, the Bible or anything like that, now's a good chance to get a good foundation in that. And then uh, the second quarter, you'll start talking about, um, um, start right off in Genesis about creation, talk about creation and and uh, all kind of different things that yeah, you, know, you can find out about creation and early, uh, early life history. And, and because Genesis is about history, actual history, and how the world started. And what, how did man fall? Why are we in the condition we're in? So I'd encourage you to come. And it gives you a good foundation to when people ask you questions as a Christian, you want to have answers, right? I mean, don't you feel awkward when, or embarrassed when somebody asks you a, qu a question about being a Christian and you don't really have a good answer for them? Well, come to these classes and you'll start to be getting those answers and get them in your own head and be able to be a blessing to others and be able to witness better to other people. So I encourage you to come. And um, let's go ahead and pray. I think that's all the, uh, the uh, announcements. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, Holy Father, we just praise you this morning. We just thank you so much, Lord, and we just thank you for, uh, Lord, saving us. We thank you for coming to earth and dying for our sins and, and convicting us one day that we were lost and we needed the Lord Jesus as our Savior and for saving us, Lord. We want to pray right now for anybody in here today that's never got to that point in their life or they're saved. And, Lord, they need you, Lord. There's, there's going to be a, a reconciliation one day or a judgment day one day, Lord God, and we all have to face that. And uh, if you're lost, it's not going to be a good day, Lord. And uh, we, we just pray for those people who might be lost and here that today might be the day of their salvation, that wonderful day they get saved and enter into the family of God. We pray for any Christians here today that might be going through some problems or troubles or might be down, and we pray, pray today they might be uh, uplifted. And uh, we just pray for the sermon today that it might touch our hearts and our minds and it might uh, uh, help change us to be better servants of yours, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.
hope you've all had ample time to fellowship. I know you got a little late start, so we'll let you go a little bit. But um, We're going to continue our, our worship service this morning um, and sing some songs. This first song we're going to sing is There's, There's Power in the Blood. And I, I hope that this morning, that throughout the week, that's something the world sees, like the, the power of, of the gospel uh, displayed in our life. So let's all stand this morning. I see you're already standing. That's good. And we're going to sing There's Power in the Blood.
Thank you for your singing. You may be seated before pastor comes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Uh, God, I, I thank you so much for the truth in the songs that we sang. Uh, Lord, that there is power uh, in your blood. Uh, power to, to rescue, to save from sin. Uh, power to make us your children. Um, God, I, I pray that uh, you would be a, a treasure to us. Uh, God, that we would, that we would seek you. Uh, that, that like the parable says, you'd, you'd be the treasure that, that we would give everything to possess. Um, God, that uh, you'd be worth more than anything that we would, we would find in you satisfaction um, that, that we long for. Uh, God, be, be everything to us today. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that as pastor comes, gives us the word, uh, that we would be hungry for it. Uh, God, that we would uh, latch on to it uh, because it, it gives life. Uh, Lord, I, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. One of the things I like to do when we have communion is to focus our attention on communion itself. I don't like to tack it on at the end of a service. I like to have the whole service focused totally upon why we're partaking of communion. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Our focus is going to be on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's special. It's precious to us. And it needs to mean something to us every time we have communion. Because when we have communion, it reminds us again of what Jesus did for us. Aren't you glad to be saved? Aren't you glad to know that if you die today that you have a home prepared for you in heaven? That God so loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. And so as you have communion today, remember communion is for God's children. So if you're not saved, just let the cup and let the juice pass from you. And be thinking about why you're not saved because it's important that you do that. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul begins to talk about communion. He's talking to the Corinthian church, talking to them about areas in their life where they have failed miserably. And this is one of the areas in the Lord's Supper. They were divisions in the church. Can you imagine that? Divisions in the church. That never happens, does it? There's no such thing as cliques in the church, is there? No, not at all. And so 2,000 years ago, they had problems in their church. Can you imagine? And so you think we would learn after 2,000 years not to have those type of things. But unfortunately, we do. But I hope we don't hear. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. Apparently we have them here, I think, huh? No, I don't think we do. Look at verse 23, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Having just come through the Christmas season, we understand a little bit about that body that was given to us. Amen? That body was special. 100% human and 100% divine. Came to the earth for the sole purpose of becoming a man, God did, so he could die upon that cross. So his body could be tortured on that cross for you today. Because without his giving of his life and shedding of his blood, there'd be no forgiveness for us today. It took something that we could never pay. It took a price that we couldn't afford. So God came and did it for us. Because that was the only way that could be done. That's why Jesus was a man, yes, but he was more than a man because he had to be. Because when he died on the cross, he didn't die on the cross just for one person's sin. He died on the cross for all mankind's sin. And only a divine person could do that. And that's why Jesus was divine. Jesus was not just a good teacher. Jesus was divine. He is God Almighty. And that's who we come to worship today. This God who came 2,000 years ago to give his life on that cross for us. To give his body. To allow his creation to take him and nail him to that tree. To allow him to suffer as he did. He allowed that to take place for you today. Think about that. Because he knew, because he was God, that you would be born 2,000 years later and you needed a redeemer. You needed to be saved and you couldn't do it by yourself. You couldn't be good enough because we don't have any goodness. And the best that we have, the Bible says, is filthy, dirty rags. And so it took a righteousness that we could never have. 
And so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who had that perfect righteousness, who came into this world to give us that perfect righteousness. And so when we turn from our sins and repentance and we come to Christ in faith, he gives us that marvelous, that marvelous righteousness that we can never earn. He gives it to us as a free gift because he paid the price for it. Look at the next verse. This is where we're going to focus our attention today. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Today, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are under a new covenant. Isn't that exciting? A covenant. God and I have something in common. And it took the very blood of God himself to give us this covenant. And this covenant is an everlasting covenant. It can never be taken away from us. That's the marvelous thing about salvation. Every one of you still sins. But the Bible doesn't call people that have been born again sinners that I know of. It calls them saints, holy ones, and God expects us to live that way as saints and holy ones because we've been delivered from our sins. We've been delivered from death and have been given life. We walked in darkness, now we walk in light. We've been different. We've been transformed by the precious blood of Christ in our life. Amen? That's what Christ does. And because of that, we have this covenant that can never be taken away because it's not my righteousness, it's His righteousness. And I sin every day of my life. In thought, maybe, indeed, sometimes. But even though I'm a saint, I still sin. And I praise God for His salvation that He gives to me because I didn't get it by works. I can't lose it by works either. That's God's grace. Where he gives me what I could never deserve. And what is that? Eternal life. And how did I have eternal life? Through the body and the blood of Jesus. And what is eternal life? We had it in Sunday school this morning. We talked about it. Everybody says it's living forever. That's not how Jesus defined it. You know, I have been here almost four years, and a lot of you don't even know this yet, so I want you to listen up right now. I'm going to tell you what eternal life is one more time. John chapter 17, verse 3. If you don't have it memorized, if you don't have it underlined, circled in your Bible, you need to do that right now. Jesus said, and this is life eternal. So he's going to define eternal life. That they might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so eternal life is having a personal, intimate knowledge of God. You couldn't have it as a sinner because you were separated from God because of your sin. But today, through the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have that intimate personal relationship with Him. And how long does it last? Forever. That's where that eternal life comes in. You have that relationship with Him forever. Do you have that today? And so today, just for a few minutes, I want to focus on the blood of Jesus. That's my vampire voice. You like that? The blood of Jesus. And we're going to look at several verses to help us understand a couple things. So let's open our Bibles, first of all, to Ephesians chapter 1. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, we see that the blood of Jesus Christ produces redemption in our life. God purchases us from the marketplace of sin. I'm going to read a couple of verses before that, so just go ahead to chapter 1 there. I'm down here today because I can't th walk up those stairs very well. I don't want to you know, think I'm a crippled preacher walking up the stairs. Got to be all masculine. Got to be all man. And I'm not there yet today. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the same sort of Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When God saves you, He gives you two things. He gives you grace, and He gives you peace. Grace is something you can never deserve. He gives it to you as a free gift, and through that gift you have peace. God's no longer at war with you because you have become His child, and He loves you. He died on the cross for you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. That word predestined scares people, but what it literally says is that when God saves you, He predestines you to look like Jesus someday. Isn't that exciting? God's conforming you even now to the very image of Jesus Christ. Some of you have a long way to go. I think all of us have a little bit to go, don't you? But that's our desire. We push toward the mark. I want Jesus to fill me. I want Jesus to consume me. I want Jesus to fill me so I can become just like Jesus. And so when I walk in this world, people don't see my sinfulness or my errors or my shortcomings. They see the very person of Jesus Christ in my life, and they say, I want that. Beloved, that's the best way to witness, don't you think? Is for people to see Jesus in each one of us? I think it is. Verse 7. In him, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have been accepted into the beloved. How have we been accepted into the beloved? What's it say? Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God accepts me into his family, not by anything that I do or anything that I could ever do. God accepts me because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me. He accepts me because of a life of another. And that should cause me to do something. As the verse says, I should praise him for his glory and his grace. When we gather together for communion, and I realize it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ produced in me life from lifelessness. It gave light to somebody who was in darkness. That should cause praise and glory and admiration to rise up within me, to give God praise and thanks for what he's given to me. That's called worship. That's worship. Worship isn't just sitting and listening. Worship is participating in the very person of Christ. That's marvelous to think about. And so the blood of Jesus produces redemption to us, but it also secures justification. Look, if you will, in Romans chapter 5. I promised you it on the aisle, but I won't do that. I'll just stop here. See, when you sit in the front, you get in trouble, don't you? I don't know if you have favorite chapters in the Bible or not, but I think chapter 5 is a good one of Romans. Got to get an amen? And if you didn't amen, I'm going to tell you why, then you can amen later. Therefore, because of all the things he has said up to this point in this letter, therefore, having been justified by faith, you know what justification is? God declares you to be something that you're not. You know, I'm pretty righteous. Righteous that, you know? In my own eyes, I try to live pretty good, don't you? We would all say, yeah, but my righteousness isn't quite where it needs to be. And so God declares me to be righteous. He imputes the righteousness of his son to me. And so when God the Father sees Tim Dillon, he doesn't see Tim Dillon's righteousness, he sees the righteousness of his son. God declares the sinful Tim Dillon to be the holy Tim Dillon. He declares me to be a saint. That's what the word saint means, holy one. And so therefore, it says, having been justified, having been declared righteous by my faith, I have trusted God. I have believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and the fact that he's coming again someday. I've turned from my sinful ways, and I've trusted Christ and the truth of his word. At that very moment, God the Father declared Tim Dillon, the sinful Tim Dillon, to be the righteous Tim Dillon. That's a gift of God, His grace. And because I have been justified by faith, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope and the glory of God. So we have peace, we have access, we can rejoice. And not only that, it says, but we can also glory in tribulations. When bad things happen to us, they don't bowl us over. We don't throw up our hands and say, I quit. Because we know that God is working in our life. 
Hey, I got news for you. You're all going to die if the Lord tarries. You realize that? Every one of you, including me. But that's the wonderful thing about it. Because I have Jesus, I can never die. I close my eyes to this world and I open them in the next. Why? Because of who he is and what he's given to me. I have, I have peace with God. I have access to God. I can rejoice in hope no matter what comes into my life. And I can glory in whatever tribulation comes. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now get this verse. Much more than having now been justified by what? By his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Think about that. You know what hell is? Hell is a long time. Talks about eternity. I'm not sure how long that is. I can't comprehend eternity because there's no time to it. It just goes on forever. And I'm going to suffer in hell for eternity. That's not something that I want to do. But I have been justified by his blood. And because I've been justified by his blood, I no longer have to worry about God's wrath in my life. There is no hell waiting for Tim Dillon because I have been justified, declared righteous by God himself. That's exciting to think about. He did that for me. On that cross 2,000 years ago, God the Father poured out upon him all the sins that Tim Dillon would ever do of when I was younger, when I was yesterday, and then all the time into the future until God calls me home. All of my sin was placed upon Jesus, and he paid for it in full. And he said, it's finished. He paid for it in full. And because he paid for it in full by his precious blood, I can now be justified. God can declare me to be righteous because someone paid the price for Tim Dillon's sin. And because of that, I have been saved from the wrath to come. And so God suffered my hell on that cross. God suffered your hell on that cross. I have eternal life. I have a relationship with Jesus that's going to go on and on forever. That's what communion is all about. To have that communion, that fellowship with him. Koinonia is the word, to have that fellowship with him. A deep intimacy with God. Do you have that? You know, most people don't. Most people just come to church and it's kind of a fringe thing for them. Man, that's not what the Bible teaches. God expects you to have that intimacy with Him, to really know Him and to walk with Him. That He's so close to you, you can reach out and touch the hem of His garment. That's a reality. Is He like that to you? If He's not, you're missing the best part of being a Christian. And so the blood of Jesus Christ produces redemption but it also secures justification let's look at another one it ensures cleansing in john chapter 1 verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light and because we've been born again god expects us to walk in the light right not in darkness anymore but we walk in the light we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus his son does what cleanses us from some of our sin, all of our sin. My sin of the past, my sin of the present, and my sin of the future. All of my sin has been what? Cleansed by Jesus. And so no longer do I walk as a sinner in this world. I walk as a saint. No longer do I walk in darkness. I walk in the light. There's a transformation in my life. That's why the church should not have divisions. Because we are one, brothers and sisters in Christ. Washed by the same blood, united into the same family, loving each other as Christ loved us. That's the church. And when we don't do that, that's sin. But God cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Man, how do you thank Him for that? How do you praise Him for that? And when the time comes for us to lie down on our deathbed, there ought to be a big grin on our face saying, Praise God, I got some place to go. Look forward to it. And so it ensures our cleansing. But it also makes peace. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And by him, who? By Jesus. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace, how did he do it? Through his blood. He did that for you. I don't know about you, but I look in the mirror. Sometimes I don't like what I see. You know, I see this tall, handsome, saint-looking young fella. And I say, man, look at that guy. You know, you might look at me and say the same thing. But the truth of it is, when I look in the mirror, I see a little deeper than the outward manifestation of what I look like. And I don't look like that, but it makes me feel better to say that. You know? When I look into the mirror, I see all of Tim Dillon's issues his problems, his shortfalls, his big mouth, the various things that he has to deal with in his life. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look in the mirror when you get home and think about your life and you see it. I love the fact that even though I am not perfect and never will be perfect in this world, I have peace. I have peace with God because he's no longer at war with me because I'm his child, I'm in his family. Amen? I'm in his family. He's my heavenly father. And he's not at war with me anymore because I'm no longer a sinner in his aspect. He's declared me to be righteous. He's declared me to be a saint. He's declared me to be holy. And because of that, I have a peace with him, but I also have a peace through whatever comes into my life. And the more deeper I love Jesus the easier I can go through those trials and tribulations that come into my life because I know whom I have believed in and I'm persuaded that he is able. What can God do? What can't God do should be our question. And so I have peace with God, and that's precious. As we partake of communion today, let's remember this one who gave his life for us. Having made peace through the blood of the cross. But it also affects sanctification. That's one of those big words again, you know, Ed, like justification. Man, that's a great word. Everybody should know what that means. What's it mean? Justification, it means to be declared righteous. The judicial act of God whereby he declares a sinner to be sinless. I like that. Well, what's sanctification? That means to be set apart. How are we set apart? Hebrews 13, 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. How did he sanctify his people? Through his blood. Is there cleansing in the blood of Jesus? And because there's cleansing in the blood of Jesus, it washes our sin away. Baptism doesn't do it. What washes our sin away? The precious blood of Christ. Baptism is just a public example of what's already happened to me. And so... His blood washes away my sin. And because of that, I have become sinless. He sets me apart to be used of God. That's why the Holy Spirit has given you gifts. We talked about that for months. Talking about the gifts of the Spirit. God has given you gifts to glorify Him. He set you apart as part of His church. He put you here for a purpose. You sit in these seats for a purpose. To minister to the body. To all of us. The gifts that God has enabled you to have. And so God has set us apart for service. Now, here's the question that I always ask, and I don't really get a good answer. Are you serving the Lord? God didn't save you to let you sit sour and soak. God saved you for a purpose. That purpose is to serve Him. Amen? You can't help how stupid people are sometimes, right? Do people hurt your feelings sometimes? People are the dumbest things. That's why the Bible calls them sheep. Sheep are stupid. Look in the mirror. I've seen that stupid one looking back at me before. You have to understand that people are going to say dumb things that are going to hurt your feelings, but you know what? Consider the source. They're a sinner just like you, saved by grace. Ah, that's true, but I'm a saint. I'm supposed to live like one. And so when they insult me, and I go home and get my shotgun and clean it, I don't do that. I just say, hey, you know, I've never done anything like that in my life. Right? You know, Dwayne, you know what I'm saying? We're, per we're perfect. I never did that, you know. you know. Have you ever hurt somebody? Said something stupid? I said a minute ago, you know, Matt the Mouth. They called me Matt the Mouth at the police department for a purpose. 
When I had something to say, I said it. Didn't much care where it went. It's like a shotgun. There it goes. But you know what? We have to be a forgiving people. Huh? It's easy to talk about forgiveness. It's a whole different story to live forgiveness. And Christ said, as they crucified him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Stephen was being stoned to death, what did they say? What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And so when somebody does something that hurts your feelings or does something to you, you say, Father, forgive them, because they're stupid. <laughs> right? They don't know what they're doing. They should know. But they're sheep. Sheep aren't the brightest crayons in the box. It affects sanctification. It gives us a nearness, the blood of Christ does. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, who you were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Hey, the blood of Jesus brings us into the family of God. It brings us together. We're not just separate families here. We're the family of Daniel's Missionary Baptist Church. You are my brother and sister. You may not like me today, but I'm still your brother and sister. I got a brother I used to hate. He was an idiot. Thought the same thing about me. We fought. My parents wouldn't leave us alone. Things would get broke. I would chase him with knives, ball bats, anything I'd get my hands on, because he's a lot bigger than me. You know, you think about it. We're brothers and sisters in the same family. And sometimes you have problems in families, don't you? What do you do? I forgive them because they're stupid. <laughs> well, that, that was part of my problem, you know. But you need to understand, people are always going to hurt you. But that doesn't divorce you from God's family or divorce you from that family. When my brother and I used to fight, you know, if somebody would do something to him, I'd be the first one there because you don't do that to my brother. I can hate him, but you can't because he's my brother. And so in our family here, you know, we love each other because none of us are perfect. And when somebody does something, we forgive them because we want to make them like Jesus, right? And so remember, we need that nearness to bring us together into the very person of Christ. And then lastly, it brings us victory. You know, one of the great Baptist songs is Victory in Jesus. You know that one? I would sing it for you, but you don't want to hear me sing it for you. Usually when I sing on Sunday night, they turn it down so nobody can hear me singing from up there as I lead the music. Isn't that a shame? Until you hear me singing, you say, no, that's not a shame at all. It brings victory. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their death, did not love their lives to what? To the death. How did they overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb. And because Jesus washed them clean, what happened? What kind of testimony do they have? They walk around moaning and groaning all the time. They walk around telling people about the fact that they've been born again, that Jesus Christ has given them hope beyond the grave. And they have a testimony. The testimony of who Jesus was. And they have a desire to tell the whole world who Jesus is. How about you? They overcame him. And there that him is talking about the devil himself. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their own lives. What was more important to them? God gave you two commandments, and we're done. The first commandment is that you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Before you take communion, you ask yourself, am I doing that? And the second command, Jesus said, was like unto the first, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And so my neighbor's life is much more valuable than mine is, or as much value as mine is. Amen? And so when somebody does something to me, and they do, as, as a pastor, it happens all the time. They don't like you the way you look. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like something that you said because you probably said something stupid. It happens to me, brother. What can I tell you? But we love them anyway. And people have to love me when I have faults in my life because of Jesus and the blood that he shed for us. Amen? And that's what the blood of Jesus does. It does all these marvelous things that give us a hope that can never be taken away, a covenant that's eternal. 
Let me have the deacons come up, and while you're doing that, let me read you something before we go any further, and then we'll serve communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we're at when we started this morning, the Apostle Paul, it's getting crowded up here. You guys can sit down. He says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Jesus is coming. He's coming. And everybody in this room is going to stand before Jesus Christ in your lifetime. You realize that, don't you? Whether by the rapture of the church, which could happen at any moment, or whether by death. But in your lifetime, you're going to stand before Jesus. Therefore, it says, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Many are dead. In other words, God has chastened people with sickness, weakness, and death. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And so that's what we do before we have communion. We take a minute, we bow our heads before God, and we say, God, through your spirit, examine my heart, because my heart is evil. It just is. Let me see those things, Father, that are unpleasing to you, and you confess your sin. Confession in the Bible means that you agree with God, that what it is in your life is B-A-D and you had did something S-T-U-P-I-D. Yeah. Let's face it. We need to confess. We're not perfect people. And so let's, let's confess our sins. And in 1 John it says, if we confess our sins, we agree with God about our faults. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about our fellowship with God. When I have communion, I want him to be here. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. He's here. He's here. Let's take a minute. Just bow our heads. Ask the Lord to search our hearts. And then let's confess our sins that we might partake of the Lord's table in a way that's worthy of us as children of God today.